Okay, so today in class, you got this handbook, Crash Course in Shakespeare. And it gives you a bunch of information, and it's all really good information. You should know it. You should read it, take notes on it, mark places if you need clarification. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is go over parts that typically people just have more questions on in general. So we're going to try to save a little time for reading the play by addressing some of the questions right off the bat. So again, you should still read this whole thing. You should look at everything and take notes on it. But I'm going to draw your attention to a few places. So just to give you sort of a preview, the ones that we're going to talk about ahead of time are the four humors, how Shakespeare breaks the rules when writing, and then I'll give you a little bit of background on the characters in Hamlet because they're so interconnected that people usually have questions. Um, again, you should still know all of this, but we're going to start just with these four. So let's start with the four humors. Four humors is an Elizabethan medical belief, uh, believe it or not. If you have ever read anything about Elizabethan England, you have probably read about the idea of bloodletting or putting leeches on people when they were sick. And that seems crazy. Um, and it is, but they had a reason that they believed it would help. And it was this idea of the four humors. What they believed is that the human body, and therefore human health, was made up of four humors, or four liquids, which is sort of a crude term, but that's what it was, um, that were produced by the body and therefore needed to be balanced within the body. Each of these four humors were also, also associated with elements, seasons, organs, these are usually where they were produced, and then emotions. So you can see if any of these are out of balance, it's going to throw a lot of things out of whack. So the first humor is actually called melancholy, and that's a word that you probably remember or seen before. So this was the black bile that is produced by the spleen. So melancholy was associated with winter, it was associated with sort of earth and darkness, and then it was then associated with the idea of depression, which is actually why we get the word melancholy, to refer to sadness. So if you had too much melancholy, you would be cold, you would be sad, um, you would be, when you think of earth, think of like you're going to be rooted down or feeling heavy. So here's your first one. This will be super important in Hamlet. The next humor is phlegm. This was the, so the fluid surrounding your brain. So this is associated with autumn. It's associated with water. This is very important. And they believe that an excess of phlegm would cause people to hide their emotions. So both of these, melancholy and phlegm, were believed to be things that would sort of make people act neurotic or could lead to depression um, because hiding your emotion then was believed to also lead to this. Uh, your next one is collar. Collar is yellow bile, so it's what's produced by your gallbladder, so this one's associated with summer, fire, um, and then anger and irrationality. Summer and fire, um, collar, and you might want to write this down, is often also associated with the sun. There's a really famous line um, early in Hamlet Gertrude is mad at Hamlet because he's kind of moping around the castle and kind of throwing a hissy fit because mom got remarried and he's not a big fan of it, as we'll talk about. And Hamlet's mom sort of snaps at him and she says, you are too much in the sun. That's a reference to collar. She's saying you're too hot, you know, sun, and summer, and fire. She's basically telling him you're being irrational and you need to chill out. Um, and you'll see when we start reading, Hamlet has some fun with that because he enjoys some, some good puns with it. But you'll see this reference. Not as much as melancholy or phlegm, but it will be referenced. The last one is sanguine. Um, sorry. Also, this is blood. So this is associated with the heart. So think of these are people who are really emotional. This is not sad emotional. It's just people who are feeling everything whether it's happy, whether it's excited, whether it's um, angry, whether it's frustrated, whether it's scared, whatever it is, just people who don't have control over their emotions. Um, this is associated with spring and air. 
Um, one of the associations with spring is the idea of youth being more emotional than others. But sanguine, to be honest, is not going to pop up a ton in, in Hamlet. It's good to know that these first three will play a much bigger part in the play itself. So this is the four humors. You want to look for references to them throughout the play. They're not going to say, your humors are out of whack or anything like that. But you'll see references to things like winter or earth or water or sun and fire. Those things are always sort of referring back to these four humors. They were such a part of society that Shakespeare would have expected his audience, whatever their education level, to be familiar with them. So he's going to make use of that in Hamlet. The next one we're going to look at is down here where it says breaking the rules. I'm going to assume at this point you have run a, read a Shakespeare play every year since you were a freshman. You know that he writes an iambic pentameter. You know that means there's five feet, which is ten syllables per line, and it's every other one. That should be familiar to you. What's going to be more important in Hamlet are places where Shakespeare breaks those rules. Hamlet is very much a play about language and about how language can manipulate people. As readers of that play, then, we need to be very attentive to how the characters are speaking and what they might be telling us without actually saying it. So there are two main things that you really have to look for in breaking the rules. The first one is a character who just doesn't speak in iambic pentameter. This is something we would call prose. Prose is a fancy word for not poetry. So if we were to go up to the top box, this is an example of prose. It is just written out in typical paragraph style the way you're used to. Poetry is obviously going to look very different. You should be able to tell whether a character is speaking in poetry or prose just by looking at the page. If it's really long, it looks just like a paragraph, they're speaking in prose. Two types of characters speak in prose. The first one is someone who's uneducated. Uh, the grave diggers, for example. They don't have formal education. Therefore, they don't have the ability to control their language into something like this. So they're going to speak in prose. The other characters are perhaps a little bit more important. And those are characters who maybe typically speak in prose and suddenly stop. This implies that either the character is going mad or that they are somehow out of control. They might be just feeling very emotional at the time. You're going to see this a lot in Hamlet, for example, the character. We need to pay attention to why characters are slipping in and out. Are they truly going mad? Are they out of control? Are they losing it? Um, they're, are they breaking prose to sort of manipulate other people? There's a lot of reasons characters can do it, but it's always important. Shakespeare's audience would have expected this. So when he stops, they would have naturally started paying attention to that. So he's doing it for a purpose. Like I said, what you were looking for is the idea of prose. The other one is a little bit more confusing, and you may have talked about this when reading other Shakespeare, so I'm going to pull this up quick. A lot of times when reading Shakespeare, you've probably noticed that you'll have a character, like Hamlet, who starts his line way off to the right. And I'm always surprised at how many people just sort of accept that and don't question it. Because it's actually for a purpose. So if you'll notice, you shall not go, my lord. This is the start of iambic pentameter. But there's supposed to be five feet. He's only got three. Hamlet is providing the last two. Hold off your hands. Hamlet is literally completing Marcellus's sentence. We have it again here with Horatio and Hamlet. We have where, my lord, and then we have Hamlet, in my mind's eye, Horatio. Again, completing each other's sentences. There's two different reasons for this, and you can see them here. Marcellus is a guard. He's very low. He's a common soldier. Hamlet is a prince. Here, he's telling him he can't go, and Hamlet is literally saying, get your hands off me. This shows control. Hamlet is more important or more powerful than Marcellus, so he tells him to stop. Here we have Horatio. Horatio is not a prince, but he is a lord, and we have Hamlet, who is his best friend. Here, this interruption or this completing of the meter shows how close Hamlet and Horatio are. 
So when you're looking, it always means two things. Either there's control happening or there's a close relationship. You have to pay attention to that. Pay attention to who is completing each other's meter and when. Because that's going to tell you something about the way relationships are evolving throughout the play. Let's go to our next one. You should read about the history of Hamlet. It is super important, um, especially in understanding that there is a, this is a Danish story originally. It takes place in Denmark. Um, that implies some things. Denmark had something called an elective monarchy. And we'll talk about why that's important. So here are your main characters. We have Hamlet. He is the prince. He's been at school in Germany, but he has come home because his father has died. Uh, his father, named Old Hamlet, is going to appear in the form of a ghost. We have Gertrude, who is Hamlet's mother. Here's where it gets confusing. She is married to Claudius, who is her first husband, this guy's brother. So her husband dies, she marries her husband's brother. And we have Claudius. Um, he is married to Gertrude. He is now king. That is worth writing down. So for whatever reason, we know in the play that the Danes don't like him, but at some point they chose him to be their leader. We'll talk about why that's important. We have Polonius, who is Claudius's advisor. He's an idiot. He's a really fun character, sort of like the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. Gives good advice, but is completely unable to follow any of it. So he's sort of our comic relief. We have Laertes, is how you say this, Polonius' son. He's been a friend of Hamlet's in the past. In this play, he's going to function as a foil. And foils are right down here. You should read about them. We have Ophelia. This is Laertes' sister. This is going to be a central question in the play. She may or may not have had a relationship. They almost certainly had feelings for each other. Uh, the relationship we're referring to is whether or not there was a sexual relationship which would imply some things about Ophelia and Hamlet that we'll get into when we start reading. We have Horatio, Hamlet's best friend. He is also a foil. Pay attention to that. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, these are servants. They used to be Hamlet's friends. Um, you'll see how he feels about them now. We have Fortinbal, who is the Prince of Norway. He seems like sort of an odd character to add in here, but you will see why he's important. Um, notice Prince of Norway, Prince of Denmark. Fortinbras will be another one who is serving as a foil. And then we have the grave diggers. These are the characters you'll see. Here's what that all looks like. So you can sort of see Hamlet is at the center of this. We have old Hamlet. Old basically is their way of saying daddy Hamlet. So we have old Hamlet married to Gertrude. Hamlet, as far as we know, is their only child. It's the only one that they reference. Old Hamlet dies. Gertrude marries Claudius. Making sense? So now Hamlet's uncle is also his father. Stepfather, but at this time, due to some religious beliefs, basically would have been his father. Hamlet is predictably not happy about this. So now we have, these are sort of your familial ties. These dotted lines imply other relationships happening. happening. So we have this, which is all happening in Norway. So we have, you know, we don't know who Fortinbras' mom is. Old Fortinbras, who has recently died. You should see already some parallels to Hamlet and Old Hamlet. And then we have Fortinbras, who is now the prince in Norway. We have Hamlet's best friend. And then we have this little tiny family down here, who is connected by virtue of the fact that Polonius is Claudius's advisor. We know Hamlet used to date Ophelia. The degree to which um, he was sort of sincere or how he treats her is going to be a matter that is typically up for a lot of debate in the play. You can see this is really messy looking, and that's sort of how it's going to read in the play too. When you get confused, it's always good to default to this, and in particular notice who are your foils, because these are the characters, and I'll highlight them here for you, that you want to sort of, not Polonius, um, that you want to always be comparing Hamlet too. And again, your use of foils, it will explain it right down here. So again, you should look over the rest of this, but for a crash course in less than 15 minutes, this is the basics, and we should be start to or ready to start reading tomorrow.